Good evening. On the eve of India's independence, a British civil servant, Malcolm Darling, set off on horseback across the country. His intention was to speak to the people of India and to gather their range of opinions on what freedom meant to them. He encountered a bewildering array of uh, opinions on the subject. For some, freedom meant freedom from, from the landlord, from moneylender. For some, freedom meant freedom from the, from the local uh, thanidar, the policeman, who was seen as an oppressive agency of an oppressive uh, state. Uh, in no case did he really see the people talking about freedom from the British as a major priority. And the reasons are very clear, because there weren't very many lives upon whom the British touched directly. The British ruled through a bureaucracy, an administrative system, and there weren't very many in this country at that time. At the time, at the peak of the British Empire in India, there weren't more than 70 or 80,000 Europeans in this country running the empire. So uh, the British presence was furthest from their mind. What they had in mind, what most of the people had in mind, was some form of uh, a system in which they would be uh, allowed to act with greater sense of autonomy, a greater sense of, uh, of their own uh, right to exercise their, uh, their will. So uh, freedom, of course, came with uh, considerable disorder, and there was uh, a lot of uh, turmoil, there was a lot of violence in the air, and it took two years to settle down, by which time, of course, the Constituent Assembly had uh, progressed very far with its work of drafting in Free India's uh, Republican Constitution. And once the Constitution was adopted in November 1949, between then and the adoption, the formal adoption of the Constitution exactly uh, two months afterwards, there was a certain kind of upsurge in the public mood and people observed that there was a certain sense of uh, optimism around and that people suddenly uh, began to have the sense of being free citizens. And for most Indians, it was a new, new sense of uh, autonomy because uh, they hadn't had that sense of being uh, free citizens till then. At best, they had a notion of being subjects of a sovereign. And the difference, of course, is very clear. In any kind of a monarchy, all rights belong to the sovereign. All power is held by the sovereign. And uh, the subjects only enjoy whatever rights they have on the sufferance of the sovereign. Whereas in a, in, a, in a republic, the citizens hold all the power, and the citizens give themselves their power and enact a constitution which is an expression of their will. So uh, there were some who cautioned, of course, that the euphoria might be a little premature. One of them was Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, always a very sag sagacious presence in our political scene. And what he said was very clear, that uh, uh, constitutional morality is a sentiment that is, in a sense, alien to India. That uh, democracy is uh, topsoil on a deeply and fundamentally undemocratic uh, social fabric, and that it takes a lot of effort and a lot of uh, good goodwill and good faith to cultivate a sense of constitutional morality. So, what exactly did Dr. Ambedkar mean by constitutional morality? I think uh, subsequent years we've been able to fill in the kind of missing gaps in his assessment and it seems that he was referring to a state in which everybody is aware of his or her rights, but more importantly also aware of other person's rights. Because uh, it is not just sufficient that you should be asserting your rights all the time, because this could potentially bring you into collision with another person's uh, exercise of his or her rights. So this is something that subsequent philosophical theory has dealt with in terms of two notions of liberty. It's associated with the name of the philosopher Isaiah Berlin, notably. And he spoke about two kinds of liberty. There's the positive liberty and the negative liberty. And the positive liberty, of course, is the right to do as your will dictates without any kind of external interference. Uh, and this could be, of course, a positive thing and a, a good thing in some circumstances because it empowers a citizen to partake of the decisions of the political sovereign. It gives him a right to have his vo voice heard in the decisions of the political sovereign. But it also potentially involves 
a threat to other people's rights because the complete and unfettered exercise of one person's rights could potentially be an intrusion into another person's rights. Right? The, the, the uh, popular way of putting it is that my right to swing my arms around ends where the nose of another person begins. Right? You, you, have the, you may have that right, but you don't have the right to punch another person in the nose. So that applies for every kind of right you can imagine. The right to free speech, the right to um, uh, profession, the right to uh, whatever else. So the negative liberty, as conceived by Isaiah Berlin, involved a zone of autonomy that every person has, where no external agency can intervene, whether it is the state or any other person or the community, whatever. Whatever be the, the system, uh, the structure of authority within that society, there is that zone of autonomy which has to be preserved. So that negative liberty can never be surrendered under any circumstances. So if you look at the uh, phraseology and the architecture of our constitution, there's a very elaborate chapter we have on the fundamental rights. And in fact, uh, the Indian constitution is believed to have reproduced at least two-thirds or more of the Government of India Act of 1935. The administrative part of the constitution is, uh, doesn't have uh, very great dissimilarities with uh, the Government of India Act of 1935. But what is really fundamentally different is in the fundamental rights chapter. And that is where the constitution makers made their greatest contribution. And the uh, phraseology of the constitution, of course, seems to couch the fundamental rights more in the language of negative rights than positive rights. For instance, let's look at one of the fundamental rights, which is the right to life and liberty. And that's Article 21 of our Constitution. It says that nobody can be take, uh, deprived of life or liberty except under process established by law. So that is a negative liberty, that when you are threatening to take away the liberty of a person, there has to be a certain process of law that is followed. Uh, take the right against arbitrary detention and arrest, uh, Article uh, 22 of the Constitution, which says that every person who's uh, arrested on whatever offence has a right to legal recourse and has to be told what the provisions of the law are under which he has been charged. Now, over time, of course, these uh, rights came to be diluted, and that is one of the regrettable features of our evolution as an independent country, as a republic. We were unable to deliver, deliver on many of those promises. And uh, th these uh, failures started right at the very inception. For instance, uh, the right to life and liberty has been uh, subject to numerous qualifications since then, particularly in matters involving uh, uh, armed forces and their special powers to contain disorder or states of uh, rebellion in parts of the country. Uh, there is a law which pertains to lives that are taken in that pursuit, but those laws are invariably uh, observed in the breach, that uh, the mandatory statutory magisterial inquiry that should follow invariably ends up being a case of, uh, case of the perpetrators themselves sitting in judgment of their own actions. Uh, similarly, with Article 22, uh, the right to uh, uh, fair trial and so on, the, the right to be informed of the grounds on which uh, you are uh, being placed under arrest. There have been, uh, right at the very beginning, there, there was a, a, an article in our Constitution, Article 13, which said that any law which is in contravention of the Fundamental Rights Chapter will stand nullified at the moment that the Constitution comes into effect, which means that as on January 26, 1950, everybody who was taken into preventive detention and the entire country would stand uh, free, discharged. But that was a situation in which the bureaucracy that had succeeded in, uh, the, in the task of administering the country really balked because there were a number of people under detention at that time, uh, starting with uh, people who were taken into custody under Defense of India rules during the World, World War. Then there were people who were uh, arrested following the RIN mutiny of 1946. And then there were lots of um, socialists and communists who were uh, in detention after the events in Telangana and other parts of the country. 
And uh, I think the administration really balked at that prospect, that uh, setting these people free would involve perhaps an aggravation of uh, the state of disorder, which was then more or less under control, but still they were a little uh, vulnerable to a possible fresh outbreak. So members of the Constituent Assembly, of course, uh, felt this was uh, uh, deeply repugnant to the spirit of a newly independent country seeking to establish itself as a, a republic of equal citizens. But um, the cabinet and the administration had its way finally. Sulhar Vallabhai Patel, who was Home Minister, went before the Constituent Assembly and said that he spent a sleepless night before he uh, gave his consent to the retention of the preventive detention uh, clauses in the, in the Constitution. So since then, of course, the, the number of uh, situations in which preventive detention is an option have multiplied. And today, uh, you find it even today that uh, there are uh, any number of laws which uh, permit for preventive detention and there are any number of laws which permit for detention indefinitely without, uh, without any uh, information being made available on the nature of the charges or, uh, or even without uh, legal recourse being available. And this again is a more or less uh, a self-perpetuating uh, power play by the executive in which uh, judicial scrutiny very seldom comes into the, into the picture. Those were the uh, two of the significant negative rights that uh, the Constitution held out which have become considerably diluted over the years. There were a few others which are very important to consider and which have the language of negative rights but which still have, uh, have a positive affirmative content about them. And I'm referring here to Articles 14, 15, 16 of the Constitution, which are uh, different in their, uh, in their uh, phraseology. For instance, Article 14, which pertains to equality before the law and equal treatment under the law, applies to all persons, all persons. Article 15, which is about uh, non-discrimination, and Article 16, which is about equal opportunity in public uh, employment, apply only to citizens. So it's very important, especially now that we're actively engaged in this uh, debate over uh, amendments to the Citizenship Act to understand that Article 14 applies to all persons. So every person who's in this country, whether as a refugee, as an immigrant, whatever, has that right to equal treatment under the law. So over time, uh, of course, this was challenged almost immediately. Uh, the, um, not, the, not the articles themselves, but under the articles, certain administrative measures such as uh, affirmative action, preferential treatment for certain vulnerable sections in uh, public employment. These were challenged. The famous case of Chempagam Dorei Rajan from the state of uh, Madras as it was then. And uh, the Supreme Court had no difficulty striking down the affirmative action uh, policies as uh, contrary to the equal opportunity and uh, non-discrimination clauses. So this impelled the government to come up with the First Amendment which protected the executive authority to grant special uh, measures of preference for socially and educationally backward classes. Now over time this of course uh, from being a, a, negative, uh, a, defini a negative definition of rights became a positive uh, affirmation because it was read uh, over time as a stronger affirmation of the equality principle. The initial reading of the Supreme Court, which is a very conservative reading, was that this is an exception to the right to equality, which is a contingent kind of exception because of certain historical disadvantages that certain sections of our people have. But over time, particularly in the 1960s and 70s, when called upon to develop a deeper kind of jurisprudence over affirmative action, the Supreme Court affirmed that this is a stronger kind of, uh, kind of uh, statement of the right to equality. That the equal treatment of unequals is itself a perpetuation of inequality. So in a sense it gave an extra layer of, uh, of legitimacy to the affirmative action programs of the government. So these are the, the, the ways in which our understanding, our appreciation of constitutional rights have uh, changed over the years. And of course, there is then uh, the, uh, the other, uh, the one 
article in the constitution in the fundamental rights chapter which you could say is uh, is is explicitly framed as a positive right and this is article 19 which is the rights to freedom it's called the rights to freedom article which pertains to the right to free speech the right to free association the right to free movement the right to uh, uh, seek uh, livelihood through any uh, profession, a whole range of rights which are, uh, which are uh, encapsulated in Article 19. And then of course, uh, which is typical, this is typical of our fundamental rights chapter, every such affirmation of rights is followed by what is called a non-obstante clause, which is a notwithstanding clause. Notwithstanding anything in the above article, you can impose some reasonable restrictions on such and such and such grounds. So uh, this has become especially contentious in the matter of uh, the right of free speech. Uh, nowadays, um, the media uh, is, uh, is uh, subject to serious intimidation if it carries critical commentary or critical reporting about uh, people in authority. Uh, there are uh, formal means of, uh, of intimidating them through what is called slap litigation, strategic litigation against public participation as it's called, when you can drag a media outlet to court on various kinds of frivolous charges and tie them up indefinitely. You can sap their resources and in these times um, most media houses are working on uh, uh, strapped budgets, they're, they're working on shoestring budgets and they don't have the, the uh, staying power to to withstand a prolonged litigation in our, in our judicial system. So this involves uh, an implicit threat to the media. And then there are other kinds of uh, intimidation tactics which are through overt acts of violence, right? Uh, threats and intimidation. And uh, uh, we recently saw that uh, a newspaper, uh, the largest circulated English, uh, Hindi language newspaper, uh, Danik Baskar, which did some uh, amazingly uh, penetrating coverage of uh, excess deaths in the recent uh, second surge of the COVID-19 pandemic was soon afterwards raided by the income tax authorities. So, so that was a clear signal to them that uh, uh, too much assertion of your right to free speech, which of course is the, is the obverse of the public right to know, right? Because the newspaper serves a public function of fulfilling the right to information. So the, the two are two sides of the same coin. So this was, in a, in a manner of speaking, a way of denying the public uh, the kinds of uh, rights that would enable them to be constructive participants in civic life. So uh, there is another category of rights, of course, which are, uh, uh, in a manner of speaking, identity specific. And I'm referring here to the rights we just referred to here about a little while back of affirmative action, of preferential treatment in certain kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, public employment. And uh, it also is, uh, is uh, inherent in the Constitution in the sense that Article 17 of the Constitution, which immediately follows the Article on Equality Before the Law, uh, Equal Opportunity and Non-Discrimination, Article 17 is an article abolishing untouchability. Now, untouchability, you could say, is the, is the ultimate form of discrimination you can practice. But it is worthwhile asking the question whether, with Articles 14, 15, and 16 already in place, is it necessary to have a further affirmation of the abolition of untouchability? Because isn't that already included within the ambit of 14, 15, and 16? The answer is yes, probably if you take an expansive reading of these three articles, the abolition of untouchability is already can be read into that. But the reason why uh, there was a specific article introduced is that uh, uh, the Indian Constitution in its fundamental rights chapter uh, is an exercise in multiple redundancies. They say the same thing over and over again in many different ways to, to avoid any possible ambiguities in subsequent judicial interpretation. So that is why the abolition of untouchability is included with a specific purpose in, in the fundamental rights chapter. Subsequently, of course, we had the Protection of Civil Rights Act. And the Protection of Civil Rights Act says in its preamble that this applies to those rights uh, that are covered by Article 17 of the Constitution, which means, in other words, that it applies to the people once 
described as untouchables. One subject to the stigma of untouchability and one subject to the, uh, the kind of discrimination, the whole um, uh, discriminatory treatments that were reserved for untouchables. So uh, it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean of course that other people don't have civil rights. It's only that the denial of civil rights over centuries to the uh, untouchables, to the Dalits as they're called now. Of course, Dr. Ambedkar had no difficulty using the term untouchables, Dalits has come later. Uh, to, the, the denial of rights to them was of such a magnitude that it needs uh, very, very kind of uh, concrete remedial measures for a period of time which could not at that time be foreseen. And as we can see, it still continues being uh, enforced. The, the special protections for, uh, for uh, the Dalit uh, people. So identity-based protections, of course, were also extended to the Adivasis, the serial tribes, as they were called. And uh, so these are the only two identity-based uh, protections that are granted under the Constitution. Now, you can ask whether uh, these are all that we need at this time. And in recent times, of course, uh, if you look at the, at the kind of uh, epidemic of uh, vigilante violence against the religious minorities in this country, then you will realize that there is perhaps a need for another kind of protective legislation, which specifically includes uh, the religious minorities. Uh, and in fact, uh, recently, in, uh, two years back, when the Supreme Court was uh, hearing a petition on, uh, on uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, wave of uh, lynching of uh, people of the Muslim faith, it uh, felt compelled to record uh, in its uh, official order what should have been obvious to all, that lynching is a scar and a slur upon our society. And that should have been obvious to all, then it didn't take, it wouldn't, in a, in a functioning uh, republic or a functioning democracy, it wouldn't have taken the highest judicial bench to affirm that, uh, uh, that kind of uh, virtual truism. But that's where we have reached at this time. So we could ask whether uh, identity-based protections are sufficient under our constitutional rights. I think now that question has to be faced and has to be faced uh, seriously and dispassionately. It's unfortunate today that all these debates are invariably drowned out by a wave of uh, orchestrated outrage from the other side, but this is something that we really need to look at at this time. And the history behind this, of course, is that um, the first draft of the Constitution had, uh, uh, had a section dealing specifically with minority rights and uh, Apart from the provision of equality under the law, which in itself should be sufficient guarantee, they had a provision, a separate provision on minority rights. Now you can say that one is uh, superfluous when you have already uh, provided for equality before the law. You don't need a specific provision on minority rights, but they believe that it was necessary and that equality, the true uh, function, the true, uh, true, true um, uh, power of the equality clause could only be realized if there is a concrete kind of provision for minority rights. But then of course, there was all the dislocation of partition that came, came about and then uh, soon afterwards, uh, uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel came before the Constituent Assembly and said that in the changed circumstances, we don't believe that we need to really persist with this uh, uh, part of our constitution. And then uh, Govindwala Pant, who was also a very senior and very influential member of the Constituent Assembly, came forth with an with a explicit kind of uh, uh, denunci denunciation of this uh, tendency to think in terms of communities. Because he said that we are not a nation of communities. We are a nation of citizens. We are a nation of citizens. And we should uh, just speak in terms of an individual citizen and his or her rights, not in terms of the the community and uh, the community's uh, collective uh, rights. In fact, uh, if you look at uh, most systems of law uh, globally, you can recognize collective rights only when they are only in their violation. For instance, when you say you can say that uh, uh, collectivity does not have inherent rights. Each member of that collectivity has uh, individual rights, but the collectivity itself does not have uh, specific rights. But you can see that when the, the rights of individuals belonging to that uh, collectivity are violated and there's a persistent pattern of these violations, then you know that collective rights have, have some meaning in this, uh, in this kind of situation. Uh, 
So uh, equality before the law, I think, has remained a, a, a fictional promise. It has not yet uh, been realized anywhere near, uh, near the way it should be. And this, of course, is not unique to India, but in India, the, the other kinds of uh, income and status-based uh, discrimination is also overlaid with another uh, identity-based kind of uh, discrimination. And that is a unique kind of challenge which in our 75-year anniversary of independence we have to really, uh, really face and address. So if the biggest challenge that we have as a nation as we enter our 75 years of independence is perhaps to make equality before the law a reality for everybody in this country. And that means at the first uh, removing the identity-based kind of discriminations that we've seen rampant over the years. Now, uh, this is very obvious that uh, the uh, infirmities in the law are what are creating this, uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, discrimination and the sense of uh, loss of confidence among several people in the processes of the law. So, obviously, the administration needs to be, needs to be uh, strengthened. But about, uh, more than that, I think we need to recognize some of the warnings that uh, Dr. Rambedkar a long time back uh, spoke about. And one was, of course, his uh, skepticism about whether India was yet ready for uh, uh, claiming nationhood status because he said that we are a vast uh, uh, array, a vast diversity of countries and different religions and, in fact, different nationalities and that it takes a great deal of effort to make a single seamless whole out of all this. And a second, of course, was his uh, belief that uh, often uh, society, and now he's he, here he's speaking in kind of a debate with uh, Gandhi and Tagore and others who spoke, who were critical of uh, nationalism in many senses because of this sense of us versus them that it uh, fostered. And uh, Dr. Ambedkar was speaking in a sense against their uh, perception that uh, the way to create national solidarity is to build up uh, the kind of uh, unity of civil society. And his res response to that was very simple. His response to that was that uh, often societies practice discrimination and oppression on a much greater scale than, uh, than governments do. So that, uh, you know, often you need to have correctives and legal provisions that arm the government with the, with the with the power to, to neutralize these kind of uh, oppressions uh, within society. Well, what's happened perhaps in India over the last uh, three decades perhaps is that uh, the uh, government, rather than using the law to correct the inherited uh, disparities, has been actually reinforcing these, has been drawing its strength by, uh, by cultivating the fissures within uh, civil society. So that accounts for several of the abuses we have seen uh, in recent uh, decades, the kind of uh, impunity for mass violence, for instance, against uh, minorities, whether it's Muslims or Dalits or uh, Adivasis. We see an upsurge of it now. We don't see it in the sense that we used to see concentrated episodes uh, earlier, but we see it on an everyday basis. There's a kind of you know, recurrent pattern that you see every day. It's a kind of, it, it's become a, it's become a quotidian part of our lives to see these videos circulating on uh, WhatsApp or uh, some kind of uh, report, which even the media, which often tries to shut its eyes to these abuses, uh, but they often feel compelled to carry these uh, reports because the abuses are often so shocking and so gross. So wh where do we uh, go about finding the correctives for these things? Firstly, of course, the uh, the administration has to be made more representative, and I think the the beginnings that we have seen in terms of uh, affirmative action should be extended to all. We need to firmly set our uh, face against the kind of disruption that uh, the other side causes when we talk about uh, fair representation for all. Now, I'm not saying that, I don't think anybody says that fair representation for all means proportionate representation in the apparatus of government, but it means that there should be a reasonable representation and a reasonable attention paid to the compulsions of equality before the law. And now, of course, we are seeing also a kind of cultural effacement that's happening. There's a kind of denial of our heritage from uh, the, the full richness of our cultural heritage and, uh, and a growing tendency to uh, 
just ascribe it to one single kind of root going back centuries. Now this, of course, is calculated to alienate large sections of our people, not just the religious minorities, but also the erstwhile untouchables, the Dalits and Adivasis, from a sense of participation in the national mainstream. And uh, this is where, of course, our practice of secularism has itself become severely deficient because uh, the way we have, we have looked at this uh, principle is in terms of uh, equality of all and equal space for all in the public sphere. But that is not how secularism works because if you're talking about equal space for all in the public sphere, there is a tendency for majoritarianism to win. And uh, particularly with, it, it provides an incentive for majoritarian kind of politics and, and uh, communal uh, modes of uh, political mobilization. So uh, a strict norm for separation of the two is necessary. I think we've made beginnings in the past, but these beginnings have often been throttled because of infirmities in our kind of uh, philosophical convictions. The way we have set about um, thinking these complex issues through have, has been uh, notably kind of weak. We need to strengthen our resolve and to and to address this issue squarely and to arrive at uh, a kind of uh, resolution, at least in terms of the principles. And of course, those uh, principles will remain uh, uh, weakly implemented or completely unimplemented if uh, there isn't sufficient, uh, uh, sufficient will in the administrative apparatus. So that's the other aspect of it which we have to attend to. And then, of course, the whole uh, cultural offensive has to be uh, has to be thwarted and has to be turned back. And we have to assert ourselves as a um, country of, um, of a very rich and diverse cultural inheritance. And for that, we need stronger protections for uh, free speech. Uh, the point now is that uh, most people, creative artists particularly, are uh, always looking over their shoulders trying to check out whether some creative uh, product that they're putting out for the public is going to meet with the uh, with the strict norms imposed by the thought police. So this kind of uh, burdens the uh, uh, the judicial apparatus uh, enormously and the judicial apparatus with its uh, current kind of uh, docket of cases is obviously unable to uh, provide the timely remedies and often it uh, it provides remedies that seek to accommodate the the voices of censorship uh, uh, to an inordinate degree. So these are some of the priorities that we need to look at. And of course, the whole um, uh, fundamental rights chapter remains integral to our identity as a republic. And uh, more than any kind of uh, 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 religion-based uh, nationalism, this is where we should be focusing our attention more and more. And um, ultimately, of course, uh, there is no gain saying the fact that um, uh, identity-based uh, discrimination flourishes on, a, on an undergird, undergirding of uh, economic inequality, of rampant economic inequality. And this economic inequality has become so sharp in the last uh, three decades that uh, polarization in society at the material level is now virtually complete. And uh, the polarization we're seeing at the cultural and uh, at the social level is perhaps an epiphenomenon of this. So finally, there is no escape from the necessity to address the issue of, uh, of economic equity if uh, we are to remain true to our, uh, our promises to ourselves at the time that uh, we adopted our Republican Constitution. Thank you so much.